Hey everyone, thanks for coming back to Test 2 Plus. I'm Trace. This is episode 2 of 5 in our series on fear. This is a show where we cover one big topic in a whole lot of depth over a whole bunch of episodes. And this week we're talking about fear. And yesterday we talked about what happens in your brain when you are afraid of stuff. And today we're going to talk about what fears might be built in. You can listen to this whole show, this whole series, in one episode over on iTunes. Make sure you check the link in the description for that if you don't want to wait for these to come out over the next few days. You can go do that. But first, fear is part of our DNA. How is it that fear can just cripple us so much? It's like our worst trait. We are built to be afraid of certain things. And one fear that a lot of us experience, especially as kids, is fear of the dark. Some adults still have this. And why are we afraid of the dark? Like, there's nothing in the dark that will specifically hurt you. Your bedroom in the dark is still your bedroom. But for some reason, we get afraid of it. We used to have to be on high alert at night. Like, really high alert because of predators. Consider this. 60% of lion attacks in Tanzania between 1988 and 2009 were between 6 p.m. and 9.45 p.m., so dusk to dark because lions are nocturnal hunters. They spend the heat of the day trying to stay cool, and as the sun starts to drop, they head out on the hunt. So it's no wonder that we would have this innate fear of the dark. We don't want to be attacked. We don't want to be eaten, you know, not necessarily by a lion, but by any predator. After generations and generations of predators attacking at night, the humans who survived in order to produce us today were more likely to have a healthy fear of the dark more alert at night. There's another theory from Sigmund Freud that suggests that our fear of darkness is linked to separation anxiety and the absence of our mothers. The yearning felt in darkness is converted to a fear of darkness. That's also another theory. And then, you know, there are other things that we're afraid of that are inborn as well, which sometimes might not make a lot of sense. Like, why would you be afraid of a snake or a spider that you maybe never have seen in real life? Doesn't make a lot of sense. You can blame our ancestors for this fear as well. According to a study from Columbia University, arachnophobia dates back to the early evolutionary phases of humans in Africa where venomous spiders posed a pretty serious threat. Victims of some spider bites were left incapacitated for weeks, exposed to danger. So even though a spider might seem harmless today and we might never actually interact with one, our DNA, our inborn fears, still have traces of these as major threats. And they don't necessarily manifest as like, oh my god, a spider! It's parts of the way that the spider moves, part of the way that they might look, colors and different shapes, things that our brain can recognize in patterns. And we pull all of that information and we're like, I don't like this, this is not good, I need to get out of here. Another study in biological psychology suggests that that same heightened awareness applies when it comes to things like snakes. Snakes also posed a threat to early ancestors, and because of it, they learned to avoid them to survive and continue to live so they could breed us. To learn more about how survival has evolved, by the way, make sure that you check out our series on survival. It is a super awesome series, definitely. Check that out. Link in the description. That biological psychology study involved 24 non-phobic Norwegian women, 18 to 31 years old. The women were shown two sets of color photos while an EEG measured their brain activity, their brain waves. 600 pictures were shown to these women, and the pictures showed snakes and spiders and small birds. And it turned out that the snake images evoked a significantly stronger brain response, which isn't all that surprising. Snakes can be pretty scary to some people. And it seems that it isn't our fault that we were afraid of these little critters. We may never actually see many of these in city life, but we have these built-in fears, which makes me wonder, are there fears that we're ingraining into ourselves now that future generations might suffer? Like, what poses the biggest threats day to day? There's things like traffic. You know, we know not to walk into the street. Are kids gonna grow up with a fear of something like that? What about this one? This is a big one. Fear of losing access to your cell phone. What if you lose your mobile phone or you forget it somewhere or, you know, you don't know where it is? It's like, Gollum in the ring, you just start freaking out. Where's my phone? And you lose your cell phone, it's just like this visceral response and it, it keeps being reminded to you throughout the day because you just look for your phone. You grab your pocket and you're like, oh, I wonder what time it is. Better grab my phone. Oh my God, it's not there. 
It ties into the fear of missing out because you don't necessarily know what's going on in the world about memory recall because we don't know people's phone numbers or maybe our calendar for the day. We don't connect with our friends either via phone or text message or social media. And it also can keep you from finding directions or feeling lost, access to personal or public information. So much stuff goes into the cell phone. And if you're missing it, that's a pretty big fear response. Are we gonna pass that huge fear response on to our kids, their kids? I don't know. I think I need to buy a notebook. That is a serious cocktail of fears. It's pretty serious. So some fears make sense. Some help us survive, but some don't really make sense and don't seem to serve a lot of evolutionary purpose. Like clowns, right? Clowns are the stuff of nightmares. They're supposed to be, you know, fun and like, oh, fun at the party. Nope. 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 No. Clowns have this weird fear that for some reason people experience. And there's, you know, some historical reasons for this, perhaps. Medieval fools, their job, they were designed to remind us of our own mortality, our animal nature, of how unreasonable and ridiculous and petty we can be. But clowns are, you know, they're always happy. They're always smiling. But Harvard Medical School psychiatrist Stephen Schalzman explains, clowns in the Middle Ages, if they didn't make the king laugh, paid a steep price. Some jesters were mutilated to make them smile all the time. They would have the muscles cut that enabled their mouth to frown so they'd always be smiling. Do you wanna know how I got these scars? That sound familiar? Yikes. Then there's the first clown ever. In the early 1800s, Joey Grimaldi created a standard clown mask and became one of the first celebrities. But with fame comes a price. The public was highly aware of this man and he had not a great personal life behind his mask. When his first wife died, it, it was covered in the press and it was followed by his alcoholic son. And that exposed these happy-go-lucky entertainers for being real people. And we can't just trust a painted smile. We have to speculate what they're hiding behind it. And that goes back to what Alan Moore said in the amazing book, The Watchmen. Man goes to the doctor. He says he's depressed. Says life seems harsh and cruel. Says he feels all alone in a threatening world where what lies ahead is vague and uncertain. Doctor says treatment is simple. The great clown Pagliacci is in town tonight. Go and see him. That should pick you up. Man bursts into tears and says, but doctor, I am Pagliacci. All of this doesn't really vogue today, right? Clowns are scary, but I don't think that they're scary because of medieval times. I'm just kind of going here. John Wayne Gacy, he was a serial killer who dressed as a clown in the 70s. He was caught and about the same time in the early 80s, missing children were beginning to show up on billions of milk cartons around the country, and fear started to spread through the United States, and perhaps people connected the serial killer clown guy to the missing children. And all of these things created this perfect storm of fear conditioning. You know, any clown, any stranger could be John Wayne Gacy. So clowns could be scary because they remind us of our mortality, the forced smiles, the faults of human nature, the uncertainty of strangers behind a mask, stranger danger, you know? At some point, that recurring fear is, of course, reinforced by stories and movies and the media. And then that fear is conditioned and reinforced again and again and again. But what about movies like Stephen King's It? You know, that tickles our fear of clowns, but... We do that to ourselves. We're doing that on purpose. Why would we do that? We'll tell you all about that tomorrow here on Test 2 Plus, so make sure you come back for that. Also, let us know your favorite scary movie down in the comments while we're waiting for tomorrow's episode to come out. Well, maybe I'll tell you mine too. It's Reanimator. It's pretty cool and scary and weird. And if you haven't watched yesterday's episode about how the brain responds to fear, make sure you click here to see that one. Thanks for watching Test 2 Plus today. Keep coming back every day for more episodes. Make sure you subscribe. And again, you can listen to this whole series on iTunes right now. You don't even have to wait. So check that out. Thanks for watching. Wow.